Jesus, where we are looking for the invisible God in a visible creation. And Jesus, when we look at the visible creation, there's a lot of things that we see that are sorrowful and give us reason, Lord, to miss you. There's a lot of distractions. God, there's a lot of hardships. And Jesus, for our church, Lord, for the hardships in their lives, from health ailments, God, to whatever it might be, I ask that you would heal them in this moment. And, Lord, that you would certainly allow them to not be distracted from the word you want to speak to them today. Jesus, we love you. I ask that you would communicate to our minds, to our hearts, to our souls. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The message title for today is the incarnational worldview. Somebody say, what? That's right. I thought that you might say that because I don't expect most of us to have a clue what the incarnational worldview is because I just spoke with one of my friends at the church who's been here for 60 years and is a little bit older than that. Okay, a lot older than that. And they're saying that they don't even know what the incarnation is. They've never heard of that in the church. Now, because they are even a lot older than 60 years, maybe they forgot that they heard this at some point. We give, we give a little bit of leeway and understanding of memory loss when it comes to age. But you know what? This is really important. And if we don't understand the incarnation, we're not going to be able to have an incarnational worldview. But before we explain what the incarnational worldview is, we're going to play a game. Who likes to play games? It's okay to like to play games. We're not talking about the beer pong from last night. We're having confession at the end, all right? So if that's your game, that's all right. We're going to make it right. But for now, let's have some good righteous fun. I'm going to ask you, what do you see in the following pictures? What is it that you see? What you see is probably going to determine the worldview that you have. It's going to reveal to you if you have an incarnational worldview or if you have something else. So this first one, what do you think of and what do you see when you look at the universe? Anybody have a telescope? Nobody. We live in, oh, a couple people maybe? Not many because we live in Downey and when you look at the sky, it's just a vast fog of pollution, right? But if you've ever looked through a telescope and you've gotten to see something like this, it's just quite magnificent. But I want to tell you, our culture looks at something like this, an expanding universe, meaning that we just keep on looking further and further out into space. And when we think that we've got it all figured out, something new is discovered. Our culture looks at that, and you know what they see? An expanding void. That's what our culture really sees right now. And it's sad. I'm going to tell you why, but that's what our culture sees. And if that's you, I'm going to explain why you see this universe, and you're really not that excited about it. Let's talk about access equating to apathy. Anybody old enough to remember when you couldn't just get on the Internet and look at a picture of the universe and solar system? Anybody remember that? Throw it up. Yeah, a lot of us. I remember a day when if I wanted to see a picture like that, I had to go find a National Geographic magazine. Some of you are excited. You're like, I remember the National Geographic, and now it's not really a thing, but this used to be a big deal. I remember going to elementary school, and they would throw whole assemblies to talk about a new picture of the universe. Anybody remember days like that? It's like, scientists, NASA, they've discovered something new, and we're going to throw it up for everybody to see, so let's get excited. And now if you look at a young person and ask them, what do they really see when they look at the universe, they don't care because they have so much access to it. There's an oversaturation, and they just don't see anything amazing because they see it too often. What about the next picture? Let's look at the world. What do you think of and what do you see when you look at the world? If I've got any flat earthers in the house, I am not going to ask you to raise your hand right now. I can assure you, and don't leave the church, come and have a conversation with me, but that is not flat. All right? We'll have a conversation, but if you see that and you say, it's not a globe, it's a fabricated picture from NASA, we've got a discussion to have. For the rest of us, if we're looking at the world, I wonder what it is that you see, because when our culture looks at this self-sustaining world, all they see 
is a death ball with a future of certain destruction. Would you agree with that? That's the word of the day, right? Whenever politicians and leaders are talking about the world, it's we've got to stop doing everything. Everything we do, we've got to stop right now. It's like there's this countdown clock, apparently, I think it's in New York, where it's trying to illustrate how long the world has left, and it's like under a minute or a couple seconds or even a second. I don't know because I don't buy any of it. But the world looks at itself and says, it's all going away. So we've got to stop right now. But here's, here's what I want to challenge you in your own thinking about the world right now. Did you know that no matter what you believe about the age of the earth, whether you believe it's a young earth, whether you believe it's billions of years old, whether you believe it's gone through lots of cycles, and even if you believe it's flat, can you agree that the world has been around for long enough that there's going to be things about the world that we won't ever know about the world until we stand before God? I wonder what the world has seen. You know what I'm talking about if you've been to prison. You've seen things. I wonder what the world has seen in its existence and what kinds of things have tried to destroy the world. And the world's always come out on the other side. I just look at this picture of culture's thoughts on the world, and it really is disheartening and it's sad. And honestly, it's a little bit embarrassing to believe that this world that has existed for a long time it's been through a lot of things. It's really sad to think there's this overwhelming movement that says this whole thing is going to be destructed. Now, this is not a free pass to say that people shouldn't take care of the world. If you're a Christian and you don't care about creation, go read Genesis chapter 1 and 2 for crying out loud. Christians should be the people who are never seen throwing trash out of their window on Firestone. Amen? I saw your fish symbol. As your bottle went out the window. Come on. We don't have stickers for Legacy Church on our cars because I'm worried what we might do and be seen for. You know what I'm talking about? I said we. I'm talking about me too. A lot of you are like, why is it that Pastor Shane's wife is always driving? That's because Pastor Shane doesn't drive very well, okay? We all have our gifts. Back off. Back off. What about this next one? I love this picture of the Garden of Eden is what it is. But what do you think of when you see creation itself? What do you see when you see like, uh-oh. What do you see when all of a sudden somebody stands up from the pew and starts coming to the stage with a dog of all things? What kind of church is this? Come take center stage, Toby. This is Toby the Legacy Dog. <laughs> Toby is a great dog. He is a safe dog, and he has been to many of our events, some of them with bunny ears. He brought Christmas presents at Christmas. Toby's a wonderful dog. But you know what? When, when a lot of people look at this intelligently designed creation, and look, Toby, this is a picture of intelligence, is it not? This dog looks more intelligent than a lot of the people I know. But when people look at this creation, a lot of them look at something like Toby and go, there's just no purpose to that. My question is, how can you look at this wonderful dog and think there's no purpose in creation? All right, I don't know if Bruce likes to be on stage or not, so I'm going to let Bruce go. Give it up for Bruce and Toby. Hey, you can leave Toby if you want. Who loves animals? Where are my animal lovers at? Where are my dog lovers at? Where are my cat lovers at? It's okay, we like cats here too. All right, we got some cat lovers. Where, where are my guinea pig lovers at? Yep, there you are, that's right. We love all kinds of creatures. And I'm glad that a lot of hands went up because it really makes me sad. I know a lot of people who look at things like Toby the legacy dog and there's just nothing felt for that. I see all the time on social media, it's like the, the number one and two things that are posted on social media are earthquake warnings in California and the loss of pets. 
It's really sad that people look at this intelligently designed creation and see a nihilistic, meaning without reason, and purposeless existence. What about this next one? What about that? What about that? What do you see when you see humanity? In the womb or outside the womb? What's your worldview? We just got to have a baby shower here for Kelly and Ryan yesterday. Can you give it up for them? <laughs> Go follow Kelly on Facebook and Instagram. She does like story updates of her entire life and pregnancy like every day. It's, it's always very fascinating, and I mean that in a lot of love. Look, she's drinking nervously. She's like, what is my pastor doing? Now, we celebrate with both of you because we don't take on the culture's worldview. Look, I'm just going to get real, and here's the reason why we have gloves on today. Our culture looks at human life and sees a dark stain to be bleached out. It's what our culture looks at when they look at humanity. You don't believe me? I mean, go look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates, I can't quite figure out why he's one of the prominent leaders in the world, other than he's just got a lot of money. This is not a conspiracy theory. Bill Gates' desire is to increase educational efforts around the world so that people stop having babies. That's what he wants to do, because when you increase education, people tend to have less children. And his whole worldview says, there's too many people, so we've got to stop reproduction. And he's a scientist, and well, he calls himself a scientist. He's a computer designer. And I do like Windows, make no mistake. I really miss Windows 95 with the first pictures of the world floating on the screensaver. Anybody with me? That's right, some of you are. But I wonder why this really apparently smart guy is at odds with somebody like Elon Musk, who's also an abnormally smart guy. And while Bill Gates says, there's too many people, Elon Musk is saying, you know what? At this point in history, we are probably at the highest point of human population the earth will ever see. And that's not a good thing because people are having children at such low rates that in our young people's lifetimes, there might not be enough humans to sustain humanity. So which is it? Which is it? Well, I don't think it really matters, to be honest with you. Both of them are missing the reality that when we look at a human being, our entire culture looks at human beings like we're expendable and we're not valuable. We're not important. And then, the world asks questions why a young person would go into an elementary school and kill a bunch of kids. I'm going to be honest with you. I have wrestled for a while and even what to say. I didn't say anything, and some of you might have had a critical spirit toward me for that, but the reason why I haven't said anything toward until now is because truly I just haven't known what to say. And I came to this conclusion, just another question needs to be asked. What would you expect? Why is the world always so surprised when we look at, clearly it's creation, something that was created by a creator. There's no way that a smart person can argue against that. How is it that when we look at creation and we say it's all meaningless, there's no purpose, it's just a great expanding void, nobody matters, and there's too many of us, how can we expect anything different to be occurring than things like mass shootings? And then you've got these ridiculous politicians who I'm just convinced a majority of them are not in line with Jesus Christ. They're in line with the Antichrist. And they throw their little prayer things up and they make t-shirts to make money. And they use a horrible event to raise their platform. And we're in this cycle. And all I really have to say as an introduction is why are we surprised? I'm going to share this with you. 
After 15 years of student ministry, because that's what I did before coming here. After 15 years of student ministry, I started asking parents more and more, why are you surprised that your teenagers are acting like the world around them when your efforts are not to raise them in a way that's different than the world around them? Do you understand what I'm saying? Here was the battle of my life for 15 years. The battle of my life for 15 years was convincing parents that church is more important and beneficial for their children than sports. 15 years. Nine times out of 10, parents chose sports. That's not a joke. Nine times out of 10. Sometimes it felt like 10 times out of 10. And guess what the rate of these teenagers whose parents prioritize something like sports in their lives, what do you think the rate of them continuing to follow God after high school continues to be after their parents said sports are more important than church? 100% without a miraculous intervention in the lives of a few from God himself. And some of these teenagers that I ministered to for seven years, for four years, middle school, high school, some of them have gone on to do horrible things. And I'll just be completely transparent with you. By the end of my youth ministry career, I wasn't even surprised anymore. There was zero surprise. Because I'd literally spent years begging parents to understand what the Bible teaches, that if you don't raise your kids to know their creator, they will never know their created purpose. They'll never know. And when I was that bold with parents, here's a lot of the response I often got. Well, I'm not saying that church isn't important. Go, well, you might not be saying anything, which is another problem in itself, but your actions certainly show that. If you never show up, why would they show up? Am I right or am I wrong? At the end of 15 years of giving my life to teenagers, I realized why God had called me to be a lead pastor before that 15-year run. It's because I realized that there would be a day where it was almost hopeless to try to reach our teenagers without reaching their parents. That day has arrived, by the way. And some people might be saying, well, what do you know about all this? 15 years. All right, in what other field are you doing anything for 15 years and then you're not considered to be somebody who knows something. You want to know why these school shootings are happening? Some people ask me, well, why does God allow these things to happen? That's called the problem of evil. It's a philosophical discussion that we have on an ongoing basis in this church, and that's a good thing to wrestle with. But this is not God's fault. Here's the problem of evil simplified. God's created people decided we don't want God. We don't want God because we don't want a God. We don't want a boss telling us what to do. We don't want his standards. We want to do whatever it is that we want to do. And God said, okay. Because God is love. That's why these things kind of happen. But here's another reality. These things happen because the church doesn't do what God wants the church to do. These things happen because a young man was not raised to know the creator who created him, who had a purpose for his life, a purpose to live and give 
the love of God, that young person was raised in a voidless existence. And that's my greatest fear as a church, by the way. That's my greatest fear, is that it's going to be the same battle for another 15 years. And it's like, look, I'm just going to tell you my position. I've read the Bible, and I'm called more than a conqueror by Jesus Christ. There's no battle for me to fight. As long as I walk in God's call, whatever the results, I've already won. I don't have to wear gloves to fight. There's no battle in Jesus. But the question is, when are God's people going to step up? And for those of you who have stepped up in this church, this is not any kind of condemnation for you. I'm amazed by the faithful in our church. I'm amazed by the people who give week after week in this church, in our economy. It's amazing. Thank you. God sees what you're doing. I'm amazed by the people who serve week after week in our church to the point that some people don't ever get to come to service because they're sitting with your teenagers and with your children. I'm amazed by that. But sadly, you know what I'm probably not going to be amazed by is the difficulty it's going to take just to convince Christians that God's word means what it says when it says things like, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Don't make a habit of not being with the church. Don't make a habit of it. Why? Well, there's actually a repercussion for yourself. There's actually a repercussion for your kids. There's actually a repercussion for the world around you when you're not here. What is that repercussion? Well, if you're not baptized weekly in the Word of God, in the community of faith, how do you expect to go out there and to have any kind of victory in life by a world that looks at creation and sees nothing but meaninglessness? How can we go to battle if we're not taking up arms? And I certainly don't mean that in an offensive way considering what's just happened in our culture. But it's also Memorial Day weekend. It's a weekend to honor people who have given their lives to a cause. They took up arms because it was a right thing to do to fight. And just in a show of respect, can we give a round of applause to those who have given their lives for the fight. That's a good thing to do, and it's also a rally cry for us. Do you realize that the Bible says every day of the Christian life is spiritual warfare? Every single day of our lives. I had a wise pastor recently speak to me, and he's been mentoring me. Wonderful man of God. He said, Shane, it's taken me 30 years of ministry to learn this. I want you to learn it now. Every day you wake up, you are the leader of your church in a battle against Satan. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. You want to know how Satan wins today? It's by getting Christians to be complacent. I was told this week, after I allowed one of you to have a glimpse into what kind of work I'd been doing, that I really need to get some leaders to help. <laughs> what a novel idea. I think that the book of Exodus talks about organizational leadership. And here's kind of what my last few weeks have looked like. I took a little break to go to the beach to make sure that I was healthy, so I want you to know that I'm taking care of it and this is not done in a way that's disgruntled or in trying to make myself awesome, because I'm not awesome, I'm willing to work for an awesome God. Do we understand that? Yeah. 
It's been 12, 15 hour days of writing messages, making sure the business of the church is organized, and we've got a major evangelism event coming. So I've been sending about 250 to 300 texts to our church, inviting all of you to join things like Sunday mornings, like Wednesday midweek church. And I went for a walk, and I went to 199 houses to invite people to come join our church. And I'm happy to do those things. I want you to know that. But what I realized is I made this big of an impact on our big city by myself. This much, that's it, church. And what I really just don't comprehend, if I can just be sincere for a minute, why does it take endless invitations to get our people to be at church consistently? Why? Why do the statistics show that if I text people from our church, they show up? And if I don't, they don't. Why do the statistics show that if we invite a bunch of people to midweek, by we I mean me, you'll show up. But if I don't, it won't. And it was hilarious because one of the people that I was talking to, oh, you should get some leaders. I tried to say, I can't make it to men's group this week because my son Jesse's sick. I need you because we had an influx of people, the biggest men's group that we've ever had. Praise Jesus. That's an exciting thing. But stop. Just stop for a second, though, because I don't care about single large events. I just couldn't care less anymore because I'm not called to be an event planner for crying out loud. I'm, I'm called to disciple you to know Jesus. And when I said I can't be there for the love of God and God's people, will you get all of those people's numbers and will you text them? And invite them, because I'm not there. No, I can't do that. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, and we're close. That's why I can beat you up from the stage a little bit, and you beat me up behind closed doors. That's fine. <laughs> but the question is, how can we live a life where we look at creation, there's clearly work to do in creation. We don't do anything, and then we're surprised about the results. I mean, it's just a real question. If everybody showed up at one time who calls this church home, we'd have five or six hundred people in this room. I long for the day that that's going to happen. And what it looks like is our church choosing to live this sacramental life series that we're talking about where we desire so strongly to make the invisible God known that we will go to any length to make him visible. Any length. I understand that life is hard for crying out loud. I get it. I know how expensive things are. It's like we're all losing weight because we can't afford groceries right now. I get it. I know that your jobs are harder than ever. I know that it's all harder than ever. But it's never a good excuse to say, oh, well, I can't make it because I'm tired. Well, it's a good thing that Jesus didn't say he was tired after he was in the Garden of Gethsemane crying all night, right? Oh, I'm tired, God. I can't make it to the cross today. I mean, for crying out loud, church, why are we surprised? And what's the alternative? Are you ready for some hope? Let's get some hope. Because here's what we've been called to. When we decide to be the body of Christ, like Roger, who just started a grief share. Thank you for doing that, Roger. That's a big deal. Monday nights. Like Matt, who's trying to reach your teenagers. Like our worship team, who practiced six hours this week. When we decide that we're all going to be the body of Christ and say, you know what, I'm going to believe what the Bible says, that the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. I'm going to put my gloves on, and I'm going to get to work. And there's no battle to be had. I'm just going to do the work and leave the results up to God. That is when the church changes a worldview that is not incarnational. That's when the church goes 
to young men and young women who look at their lives as voidless, purposeless, meaningless pieces of misery. And my gosh, let's have a little bit of compassion and grace, church. We need to come here. The world's horrible. It truly is. It's a horrible place. And after 15 years of student ministry, I understand why a teenager who's forced to sit in a godless educational system and for the teachers who brought God into it, praise God for you for breaking the statistics. But in general, a godless, awful education system that is really just a political agenda of the Antichrist to raise people up to stand against Jesus Christ, I completely understand why our young people are so anxious, so depressed, so miserable, and it's not their fault. Have you ever tried to ask a teenager to make a wise decision without parental intervention? It doesn't happen very often. They're not wired to be wise. They're wired to do stupid things so that they could burn themselves and understand that probably wasn't a good idea. But parents are wired to say, don't touch that. You know what would happen at Legacy Church? And I just know this is happening because you've told me. Like, hey, am I going to see your kid at youth group this week? Oh, well, they don't really want to go. Really? And you're surprised by that? You tell a teenager, we're going to go on a family vacation to Hawaii. They don't want to go. You know I'm right. If you're a parent and you're not bringing your kids to church because they don't want to go, you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, why? Right? Am I right, Matthias? For 15 years, I had parents come to me and go, you're not doing enough to get my kid to youth group. I said, there's nothing in this world that I can do to get your kid to youth group, but you can. It's like for me, it was my Uncle Rob. I never wanted to go to youth group. Guess what? Didn't matter to him. He showed up in my house. Somehow got inside. I tried to hide from him, and he pulled me out from under the bed and took me to church. Never regretted it. Good for Uncle Rob. And what about you, though? Here we go. If the world sees this voidless existence, what does the sacramental life see? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. The sacramental life sees the invisible God of life in the visible creation full of life. Ladies and gentlemen. When I went for a walk around Downey to 199 houses, do you know how much beauty I saw? How many wonderful people I saw? How many conversations I heard? How many things that paint a different story than the news? I saw a purposed creation just waiting to know their creator. It was a beautiful sight. And it's all a beautiful sight. Look, the ugly things we've been just talking about, that's all sin. That's all sin. That's all that it is. But would you stand with me for just a second in honor of God's word because we're going to look to Psalm 19 to see what the sacramental life sees. Psalm chapter 19 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. When we look at the solar system, at the universe, it takes a very unintelligent person to say this is possible without a creator. And I mean that in love. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Have you ever gone on a flight and you've flown through clouds? Have you ever seen how beautiful that is? The whole sky cries out of God's glory. Day to day, pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Have you seen the beauty of the moon, especially when it looks big and turns red? Everybody gets excited about that. That's all creation crying out, saying, there is a creator who loves his creation. Do you see him? Or do you just see a big rock in the sky? There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard? Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, beautiful like on a wedding day, every day leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. 
How long has the sun been doing its thing, shining and floating around in this expanse that we call space? And how incredible is it that big balls of gas and big chunks of rock float in nothing? That's called the power of God in our universe. It is rising from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And I do love some honey, church. Like Pooh Bear loves his honey. Pastor Shane loves the honey that God has created through the honey bees. It's more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. Moreover, by them is your servant warmed, and keeping them there is a great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, this wickedness of the world. Don't let this sin have dominion over me, O oh God. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock. And my Redeemer. Can somebody say amen as they sit down today? Legacy Church, what does the sacramental life see? This is what the sacramental life sees. The sacramental life looks at a universe and sees an eternal creator. It looks at the world and sees a purposed intelligence. It looks at creation and sees God's creativity. It looks at people and sees the image of God. And it looks at the Bible, the word of God, and it sees the incarnation. That is what the sacramental life sees. But what is the incarnation, the heart of this incarnational worldview? Let me tell you. The incarnation is the starting point of the sacramental life. And more important, we'll just say the Christian life. This is how it's defined. Stay with me and write this down. If you don't already know this, this is how significant the incarnation is. If you don't know this, you might not know God. That's not a joke. Incarnation is defined as God taking on flesh. And biblically, we see this in John chapter 1, verse 14. It teaches this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I'm like, well, what? If you're not familiar with God's word, you might be saying, well, what is this word? Well, that's Jesus. And we'll explain that in a minute. But it says, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Here's what we just learned. Jesus is the incarnate God who was born in flesh and lives forever in full divinity and humanity. I know some of y'all are watching Moon Knight on Disney Plus and it's talking about all these Egyptian gods, all these false Egyptian incarnate gods. It's all false and it's all marvel. It's not real. But all of that is based on the real incarnate God that is Jesus. And here's what we learn about this God. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning. Now, hold up. When it talks about the beginning, it's using words that are understandable by humanity. Here's just a ridiculous question, and I say this with love to you, but one of the most common questions about God the creator is, if you don't know God and you're trying to disprove God, well, if everything needs a starting point, then who created God? No, no, no. What the Bible was teaching us here is that in the beginning, as in, in an eternally existent past with no beginning, so before the beginning, in words that we can't even comprehend as humans because we don't know what it means to exist eternally. So in an eternally existent past was the word. Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Here's what we learn about this incarnate God. Jesus is the eternally existent God. He had no beginning because He is the beginning. He's called Logos, which is a Greek word that means word, but it's teaching us that Jesus is the Word of life, the one who speaks life. 
And we learn that Jesus is God and was with God. And that's a little bit of a mind bender, so let's make it a little bit more simple. God is the singular deity communally living as three persons. This is a Christian doctrine called the Trinity, something that attempts to describe the indescribable existence of God. There is one God who chooses to exist as three persons. If you can figure that out, I want to know what planet you're from. Because clearly you are not human, you are an alien, all right? We cannot comprehend this, but I want to make it more simple for you. And this is important. If you do not believe this, I don't care what you believe. I care enough about you to tell you that you don't believe in Jesus. There is one God. The Bible calls him God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And if you were to see this God, here's the picture that the Bible gives us. And one day we will see God if you know Jesus is Lord and Savior. We will stand one day before the throne of God, and in the center throne, we will see God the Father who is spirit. God the Father has no flesh. As far as we know, he's never taken on flesh, and he never will. Because at the right hand of God, we will see Jesus Christ in flesh, the incarnate God, who did not always have flesh at one point in history for a long time eternity of history, Jesus did not have flesh, but he took on the flesh of man, and for eternity forward, Jesus will always look like a human to us, but he is not only human, he is 100% God, and he is 100% man, so when we are in heaven, because these are pictures from the Bible, in our limited understanding, we will see God the Father, and we will see Jesus the Son, and it will look like two beings, but it is one. And you might be saying, well, what about the Holy Spirit? I don't know that we'll ever see the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, he's attached to us, and he's the one who allows us to commune with the perfect God. He's the one who seals us in this relationship. Now, that's just a theory. We might see the Holy Spirit, but if we do, the Bible doesn't tell us what he will look like. By the way, he not it. Very disrespectful to get a God's pronouns right, wrong, right? That's not a joke. It's very disrespectful to get a God's pronouns wrong. So let's get it right. By the way, my name is Shane. He, him. All right? Verse 3 says this, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Some of your worldview doesn't believe this yet. But here's truth. Jesus is God, the word who reasoned and caused creation through the power of God's voice. And here's why this matters. Jesus is the creator. He is not creation. Most of the world believes that Jesus was a real person who was created by parents like you and me. They don't believe that he had a heavenly parent. But I will tell you this in love. If you don't believe in the Jesus Christ of history, you're on the wrong side of intelligence. There's more proof of Jesus' existence than there is some of our presidents. And that's a true statement. There's just debate on if Jesus is God or if he is only man. But if you want to know Jesus, Jesus himself says, I am God and I am man. I and the Father are one. Jesus is not a created being. He created and creates all beings. In church, it's just time to grow up. Okay, we got gloves on today. If there's any debate about babies that are inside of their moms... Can I just tell you that debate is a satanic, antichrist worldview? Can I tell you that? I already pointed Kelly out to you today. We threw a baby shower because there's a living human being inside of Kelly right now. Can we give a round of applause for babies? 
And can I tell you that anybody who tells anybody that that is not a living human being does not know the somebody who creates all beings. I know there's people who are confused in our church because the culture has infiltrated all churches. You got to believe in life. Speaking of life, verse 4. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Looking at verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. In verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Why did Jesus become man? Why did Jesus, God, take a step down? It was not a promotion for him by taking on an earth suit. Here's why. Jesus entered the darkness of a creation that was dark because it rejected God's light. And Jesus said, I'm going to come to my creation to redeem it. And for all those who believe in me, they will join me in my work of redeeming a lost creation. Our work as Christians is to join the work of the creator in bringing light to a very dark world. Can I ask you, how are you turning on the light switch? How are you doing it? What are you doing? How do you spend your time? Here's what I've learned. The more I go all in for Jesus, the more I see how dark our city is and our county. And when I believe God's words about me and not the enemy's words about me and sometimes your words about me, I hear them all. You know what I believe? Jesus saved me from darkness so that I can go out as a light that the world will see. And it amazes me. Because it's not me. I don't want to go to 199 houses. I like my house. I didn't like it when the German shepherd tried to jump over the fence and bite my face off. Still a good dog, by the way. I saw, saw the work of God in that dog protecting his home. Wish my dog was a little bit more useful. Somebody tried to break into my house. My dog walks up and says, where's my treat? I like a good German shepherd that's going to protect. I didn't like the crazy guy who was drunk or high and tried to chase me off their property. I didn't like that. But you know what? I like that Jesus loves it all. What about you? Here's my guess. My guess is that just like heresy has always come against the incarnation, that you might have some kind of heretical worldview yourself. If you don't understand what a heresy is, it's just a false teaching. That's what a heresy is. False teaching. There's really three prominent heresies that have come against the incarnation. And it's important for you to understand them because your worldview probably comes from one of them. Let's have a look. Here is the most prominent heresy of Jesus' day when he was going around doing ministry. It was called Gnosticism. In fact, if you read the Bible, the book of Galatians is pretty much the book that comes against Gnosticism. Here's what Gnosticism teaches. Essentially, the most important tenet of Gnosticism is rejecting the humanity of Jesus. It rejects that Jesus was human and teaches Jesus could never be human because all of creation is evil. Now, Gnosticism is really interesting, and we don't have time to teach all that Gnosticism teaches. But essentially, Gnosticism, at least one form of it, the most prominent, believes that everything that is created was not created by the true God. All of creation was created by a lesser false God who was evil. And therefore, all of creation is evil. So why would Jesus, who is God... Take on the flesh of an evil creation. Well, it's important to know where these things come from. 
And even though he didn't create it, there was a guy named Marcion of Sinope who was the greatest proponent of this false heresy called Gnosticism. Now, Marcion, he, and come to me because this should terrify you in one hand and it should amaze you on the other hand. People rightly ask, where did our Bible come from? Anybody ever wonder that? Is the Bible trustworthy? Where did the Bible come from? It's important to ask those questions. That heretic right there is the person who first organized what we call the canon of the Bible. He took Paul's letters. He took a lot of what we see in the New Testament, and he said these things are of God. The first form of the Bible was put together by a heretic. And that heretic, who was a Gnostic, looked at the Old Testament books and said, none of these things are true. None of the Old Testament books are of God because that God of the Old Testament, he's an evil, lesser deity who created an evil creation. That's what Marcion of Sinope taught. And I hope that you're rattled enough to ask, well, can we trust the Bible? Absolutely. Because God can use a bad guy to do a, go a good thing. Am I right? But why does any of this matter for you? Well, you need to know that if your heresy is rooted in Gnosticism, you don't want to reach the world around you. You would rather condemn it. If you didn't hear that, if your heresy is rooted in Gnosticism, you don't want the world to know Jesus around you. You want the world around you to go to hell. And you know what? Can we as a church, let's just unite for a minute. There's an ugly interior inside of these earth suits in all of us, right? Sometimes it's difficult to bring ourselves to a place where we want God to save his creation because some of the created beings running around are really bad, right? Come to me. When we think about a school shooting, there's almost always one person that we really hope is gone and that they're roasting in hell. The shooter. Those are the people that I hope Legacy Church reaches. And I hope that you take on the heart of Jesus to such an extent when you look at somebody like that, you see somebody who desperately needed the love of Christ. If we can't get there, it's heresy. Sometimes Memorial Day weekend is really hard because we celebrate about our enemies being wiped out. We're not talking about war today. But war should never be something that's celebrated because people who Jesus loves die apart from knowing him. Doesn't matter what side. You understand? We shouldn't ever rejoice in the world being condemned. I understand that when we look at it, especially nowadays, most of it is easy to see how much it needs to be judged, but we're not the judge. And we're always only one footstep off the edge from becoming somebody that the world would desire to condemn. I really hope that your heresy's not rooted in Gnosticism, and I think that it's probably more so rooted in modalism. Modalism is the heresy that rejects the communal personhood of God and teaches Jesus is one of three forms God chooses to take. That's what modalism is. If you believe in modalism, you don't believe in the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And the only reason why you wouldn't believe in that is because it's too great of a concept to explain. As we've already shared, we as humans can't put God in a box that we can understand because he's God and we're not. So what we tend to do is we tend to look at God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and say there's no way that any of this makes sense. There's either three beings or there's one being, and that one being takes different forms. And that heresy came from a man named Sibelius. 
It's amazing where you can see that false teaching originated. And this came from a man named Sibelius who took this teaching and really it started to grow throughout Africa and Rome. This heretic was teaching that God chose a different form depending on what he was trying to do. So he said that he took the form of God the Father in creation, God the Son in redemption, and God the Holy Spirit in sanctification. So he really tried to split the person of God based on three different workings of what God does. Here's the problem. That's not what the Bible teaches. And there's specific instances where we see God the Father speaking to God the Son. And from our perspective, there's two different people there. And how we reconcile that as one God, we're going to have to ask God someday in heaven. So why does this matter for you? If your heresy is rooted in modalism, you don't know Jesus. You only know a false God you call Jesus that takes the form of you want, depending on what you want. I love you, church. I don't want to beat anybody up today. It's my job to save you from the false God who wants to beat you down. Here's modern day modalism. I know that my pastor week after week says that I need to physically be in church, but you know what? Hey! I got this big camper, so my God's the God of camping. I got my sports game. God loves football. For the young people, it's like, God loves sleep. It's hilarious. I invite people to church all the time. It's like, what time's your service? 10 a.m. I remember those days. Anybody remember the days where you could sleep in? As you get older, you can't sleep in anymore. It's cruel, right? Let's have a round of applause for the days we used to be able to sleep. Man, Lord Almighty. Doesn't matter what time I go to bed. The sun peeks through the blinds. It's like, I'm up. 6 a.m. No, come on, buddy. What form is your God taking? Uh, by the way, this false God right here is the reason why Christians will say things like, oh, it's all just supposed to work out. It's all going to work out. God's with me wherever I'm at. I'm going to share this with you so you know God's alive in our church. From time to time, I get to work with some really amazing people who know that they need an intervention from Jesus. And they're not even a part of our church, but I met a young lady who's addicted to meth. She sought out some counseling, believed that she had all of this addiction under control, that God was with her. She believes in God. What she didn't realize is that her version of God that wanted her to stay on meth is not Jesus Christ. That's the Antichrist. And I'm not going to tell you her name or anything more than that. But we're praying that this young lady follows through to the commitment that she made to God and me that she's going to go and join a rehab this week. But the question is, what form of addiction does that false God bring forth in your life? What is it? Because whatever it is, that false God is keeping you away from God's purpose, which is for you to be a light that reflects the incarnate Jesus. Now we come to Arianism, and this one's really simple. As we start to come to our finale today, this is the heresy that rejects the incarnation and divinity of Jesus altogether. It just says that Jesus is a created being. He's not God. It was conceived by this man named Arius. He was a really dangerous bishop of the church. He took a verse out of context, which is what false teachers always do, what heretics always do, what you and I do if we don't like what the Bible has to say. But this is what Arius said. 
Arius combated Trinitarianism. And he created this whole false doctrine based on John 14, 28. He said Jesus said something he didn't mean. This is what Jesus said. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So Jesus is praising God the Father. And because Arius saw what Jesus said, that the Father is greater than him, Arius came to the conclusion that there's no possible way that Jesus is God. He just said it. He said God the Father is greater than Jesus is. So Jesus is a subservient, subordinate, created being, and that's probably how some of us treat Jesus today. If your heresy is rooted in Arianism, you don't believe that you need to do anything that Jesus said we need to do because you don't really believe that Jesus is God. The incarnational worldview sees the invisible God in visible creation. The sacramental life seeks to live in such a way that this incarnate God is seen in his created humans that he loves. I'm abandoning the end of the sermon today. I'll share it with you next week because I think the Holy Spirit wants me to share this with you. The best person in this church who knows what it means to put it all on the line for Jesus is my wife. And I'm going to prove it to you. Whitney understood that our summer festival from last year was so important, not for a festival, not so your kids can ride a donkey or whatever. Not so some teenagers could cry, try to climb a rock wall or we could feed people in Downey. Whitney knew the summer festival was so important for the sake of the gospel, for an opportunity for an eternal destination to be changed. That while she was serving that event last year, she was actively miscarrying our baby. What she did was so incomprehensible to me that her service on that day forever changed me. I've never looked at her in the same way because her ways in that moment reflected God's ways to such an extent that I just couldn't even understand Nobody knew. And now you do. We're going to rise together. I'm going to invite the band up. If you're new, please stop by the back. Get your legacy mug. I want you to put some tasty coffee in this every day. And remember that you were made by a creator who loves you. And there's a church here that loves you too. And for those who have been around for a while, this is our new moment of service. I'm going to give you some pretty specific instructions. I don't want anybody to be confused. So we're going to take communion every week. It's important to join our creator in a visible method of worship. The cracker in the back, it represents Jesus' body that was broken in so many ways. I walked 199 houses. Who cares? Jesus walked everywhere. He walked everywhere. The son might be saved. He's put on a cross so that some might be saved. And the juice represents his blood. His blood was shed so that mine and yours doesn't have to be. So when you go to the back, if you have a Catholic background, this is not a joke. Don't sip the goblet, all right? 
dip. Dip the cracker in. Worship Jesus in that way. Simultaneously, we have a ministry called Prayer House. Who has a prayer need today? You're alive and you don't have a prayer need? Who has a prayer need today? Yeah. If you have a prayer need, I'm going to ask you to join Prayer House after you take communion in the lobby and let somebody pray, pray for you because that's an act of worship that we're supposed to do as a church. And also, if you have something to confess... If you have sin in your life, if you need to be free of the burden of sin, if you need to walk in the path of not being convicted anymore, to live in that freedom of Christ, I invite you to join me or prayer house in the back and to confess that sin and to find freedom today. And then, whether you have work to do in the back or not, I invite you just to continue worshiping with the band. And on this day, I just, church, I'm asking you to be the victorious conquerors that Jesus calls his church. Lord Jesus, you are the incarnate God you took on flesh. You didn't have to do that, God. You did not have to walk like us, talk like us, show us how to follow you. God, you didn't have to do those things, and you did. And Lord, right now in this moment of worship, we come before you, God. Jesus, I just ask, Lord, that you would make the invisible God known through the visible life of Legacy Church. Jesus, we want testimonies in this church of people being freed from drug abuse, alcohol abuse. God, we want, we want our church to be the church that changes a young man's life who without the intervention of God would go and take the lives of others. God, we want our church to be the church that doesn't worship a false God, that doesn't allow the idols of this world that says you got to be a part of this or to go and do that. God that says, no, I'm putting all of those things aside that the visible God might be known in my life. And Lord, for the people who are already all in with you, giving it all to pursue almighty God here. Oh, Lord, would you give them strength and allow them to rise up on wings like eagles, Jesus Christ. We'll join you now in worship, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>